How do commuter rail trains stop so perfectly on a platform? It might sound self-explanatory, but there's a lot more behind this simple seeming action than you may think. To find the answer, look no further than these. Known as car markers, these subtle little signs are crucial to stopping your train on the right spot at a platform. But how do such signs signify the much more complex process that is railroad brake systems? Come along and learn how your train comes to a stop. In order for a train to be able to align with car markers, it must have properly working brakes. Let's follow a random set of equipment around Boston for the day to learn about the in-depth of how this system works. Thank you to Alan McMillan, retired MBTA railroad engineer, for providing me with much of this information. Let's get started. The braking process for our train starts before its first run of the day. When the train is still in the yard, the crew must do what is known as a Class 1 brake test. First, the engineer does a leakage test in the locomotive. If they find that the locomotive is having more than 3 pounds per minute air leakage, then the locomotive is not ready for service and must be fixed. After that, the engineer applies the brakes and a crew member walks the train to make sure all of the brake shoes are properly touching the wheels and that the piston is out on the brake cylinder. Following that, they tell the engineer to release the brake and walk the train to make sure that the brake shoes and pistons are in proper position. Now, our first train is set to pull out of the yard and head into service. This train will be making its first run of the day to Rockport Station. As soon as the train arrives at the station, and this applies for any last stop, the conductor sets a handbrake in the cab car. Every rail car and locomotive in the world has a handbrake. That's the cranking sound you hear. Handbrakes are applied when the crew will be leaving a set of equipment behind or stationary for a long time. This assures that the train will not move when unattended. About five minutes after that, a conductor does a brake check in the locomotive. Because of the Class 1 brake test, the crew already knows that their train brakes are working. So all they have to do is a brief release and application of the brakes in the cab. They also must cut out the brake in the locomotive in order to change ends and operate from the control car back to Boston. For the next 15 to 20 minutes, the train is secure. The brakes have been tested and there is nothing to do besides load passengers. It's now about 5 minutes before departure and the engineer has arrived in the cab. First, they release the handbrake. Then, they release the dynamic brakes and allow for air to flow through the tanks. And once the clock strikes departure time, they're off. All revenue trains on the system do a running brake test when they depart the origin station. The goal of this is to apply enough brake for the engineer to feel the train slowing down as it moves.
It is essential that the engineer and conductors know that the brakes on their train are working. Otherwise, well, that wouldn't be very good. The car markers are always on the inbound engineer's side of the train. That is because, for an inbound train, the engineer sits four to five car lengths behind the coach they are trying to spot with the high-level platform. Going outbound, there are only one to two car lengths from that spot, making it much easier to make a good stop on the platform. However, outbound trains still have car markers on the engineer's side. Seen here at Swampscott Station are two car markers. One telling the engineer, if you stop here, your first car door will line up with the mini high. The other telling them that if they stop there, the back of the first and front of the second car door will align with the mini high. Let me explain these car markers a little better as we approach Montserrat Station. Each commuter rail station with a mini high level platform has these signs. Each engineer is responsible for lining their cab up with the corresponding car marker that resembles how many coaches their train has. So, if they were operating a four car set, they would stop at the four cars car marker. However, at stations without mini high platforms, like Salem, there is no need for car markers because the entire train can be accessed by a high-level platform. So, at stations like these, it is up to the engineer's discretion on where to stop the train. Moving down the line to Swampscott, Let's observe this operation in real time. Riding on the inbound, we hit the max speed of 70 miles per hour, just before arriving at Swampscott Station. Soon after, the first brakes are applied. Continually, the brakes are applied more and more, until the train is arriving at the station at a much slower speed. Let's watch as an outbound, and then my train arrive in Swampscott. This train has five cars, so the engineer lines up the train with a car marker that says five cars.
Now let me be clear. This whole brakes and spotting trains thing doesn't just apply to passenger rail. It is also crucial to freight rail operations. This is Tocoa, Georgia, a small town nestled in the state's northeast corner. Numerous local jobs operate out of the town's small rail yard. Let's take local P-45 as an example. P-45 is making its final moves before its departure. Switching out the east end of the yard, P-45 has just picked up a new cut of cars. As they hook on, they must first perform a brake test. Once that test is complete, they can proceed. This is where freight and passenger rail differ. Freight rail yard operations are far too complex to have car markers. Given that there is no specific location where they would come in handy like passenger rail. Instead, freight operations use the conductor and their radio to verbally spot the cars. The conductor will give the engineer indications of where to stop based on car lengths. Now that the train is put together, another brake test must be performed. Then the train is clear to finish switching. In addition to spotting cars, freight companies secure their trains in a similar manner as well. This is local P-72 from Shambly, Georgia. They have just shoved their train into the yard lead here at Tacoa. The engine is about to detach from the train and run to the other side of the yard. Similar to leaving a passenger train at a station for multiple hours, P-72's crew must leave this cut of cars and therefore set its handbrakes. This is done by spinning a circular crank on the car's front. Now the locomotive will detach from its cars, snapping the brake air hose and leaving the cars on their own to be moved later tomorrow. Thanks for watching. I hope you learned a thing or two more about how trains stop. And hopefully, next time you ride the train around Boston, you'll notice some of these things on your trip. If you enjoyed, please consider subscribing to my channel and leaving a like. Anyways, until next time, I will see you all again soon, out there on the rails.